of releasing criminals into our society. That has not been playing well. If we put a cap in, in my jail, then where are these persons going to be? They're going to be out in the community with the opportunity to re-victimize persons in our communities. I unequivocally apologize. That from freshman Democrat Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. How do you not have the resolution of censure against Ilhan Omar for all of this? And the reason is because the Democratic Party deep down actually agrees with Ilhan Omar. Senator Kamala Harris <laughs> talked about her own personal use with marijuana. Still smokes? I have. Okay. Like and I, and I inhale. I did, in, I did inhale. inhale. <laughs> Listen, I think that it gives a lot of people joy. According to a new Gallup poll, optimism over personal finances is at an all-time high. So 69% of Americans say they expect to be financially better off at this time next year. It's going to be a snow day. Good day to watch cable. Right, absolutely. And there's a good day to watch cable because there's a lot of breaking news uh, from the president's rally last night uh, to Beto O'Rourke's rally in Counter, including a border break, uh, uh, a breakthrough on the border deal. Uh, we could be looking at maybe an avoiding uh, a shutdown. We start this hour with the Fox News alert. An agreement has been reached in principle, the Congress people say, to secure the border and avoid a dreaded second government partial That's shutdown. Right. That's right. Now the clock is ticking for lawmakers to hammer out the details before the deadline on Friday night. And then how will this deal be accepted by both sides, if at all? Griff Jenkins is live in Washington with the latest. Hey, Griff. Hey, guys. Yeah, we're thin on details here, but it appears that both sides could claim some victory. Let's look at this. Now, for the White House, you've got $1.375 billion for 55 new miles of border barrier. Don't call it a wall. It's a barrier, according to Democrats. All of it will be in the Rio Grande Valley sector, and the Border Patrol can use any currently deployed design they want to build it. Now, for Democrats, it has a 17% decrease in ICE detention beds, reducing the number from 49,000 currently down to just over 40,000. But there may be some wiggle room there because DHS funding elsewhere could give them the authority for more beds in the event of a surge on the border. The big question is whether the president, who put the wall front and center in last night's rally, would sign this. Walls save lives. My administration has put forward a compromise. It's compassionate and it's going to solve our problem. Already, this deal is not going over well with conservatives. Congressman Mark Meadows tweeting this. This conference agreement is a hardly uh, serious attempt to secure our border or stop the flow of illegal immigration. It kicks the can down the road yet again, failing to address the critical priorities outlined by Border Patrol chiefs. Congress is not doing its job. Next up, we'll actually get the language, hopefully, at some point today or tomorrow, guys. That's yeah, right. But one important element, thanks, Griff. Uh, one important element is uh, when Nancy Pelosi says, here's $1.3 billion, not one dime, not one dollar for a uh, barrier or fence or anything. Uh, Cindy Hoyer said, I have no problems with barrier. We're wondering what's going to happen there. Now, all of a sudden, you got $1.37 or whatever it is, uh, or just under $1.4 billion. Right. And it go to anything you want. You can put bollard fence, can fix fence, or can continue. Well, and speaking of Cindy Hoyer, he said yesterday he's got no problem with ICE. ICE uh, does a really important thing for us. Yep. Keep in mind, uh, yesterday when we last saw you, uh, the talks had broken down because at the 11th hour, the Democrats had, had uh, started talking about limiting the number of beds that they could be used for detention. That's really a euphemism for how many people could ICE possibly arrest during the course of a year and then deport and process and things like that. And the Republicans said, this is a, this is a non-starter. That's going to work. So the president last night in El Paso was talking about that and how the Democrats were trying to put a cap on the number of people that ICE could detain. And he didn't like it at all. We love our ICE officers. ICE officers have made 200, listen to these numbers, 266,000 arrests of criminal aliens, including those charged or convicted of approximately 100,000 assaults, 4,000 kidnappings, and 4,000 murders, 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 killings, murders. If we cut detention space, we are cutting loose dangerous criminals in our country. Slashing ICE detention is the first step of many for the far left I call them the radical left. We will never abolish ISIS. 
Well, the sheriff of Rockingham County, his name is Sam Page, is on the same page as the president. Listen. It jeopardizes public safety. Uh, you know, I look at it, if, you know, if we put a cap in, in my jail, at the local jail, and said you can't house no more than 200, then where are these persons going to be? They're going to be out in the community with the opportunity to re-victimize persons in our communities. I gave the letter to the president. 72% of the persons that are, they're, they're being held, they're being held for mandatory detention crimes. And 90% of the persons that are being detained are charged or convicted of criminal offenses or in deportation status. So uh, that was the sheriff last night. Keep in mind, when it comes to detention beds, uh, they feel as though the, the administration, they could, and does a Senator Shelby, they could free up $750 million and get up to 52,000 beds. They could end up with more. Sadly, we're going to need more to, to do this. So before everyone gets in their talking points and grab sides later on today, uh, there's so much wiggle room in this deal that both sides can walk away and be a little disappointed and be a little happy. Well, the president said last night in El Paso, we're going to build that wall. So how's he going to do it? Uh, Mark Meadows, who uh, Griff was just quoting a moment ago, who's uh, one of his confidants up on Capitol Hill, he has sent out some tweets in the last uh, couple of weeks talking about how there are ways for the president under U.S. code, a couple of different codes, uh, where he can reprogram money without declaring a national emergency. So maybe that's what the president's talking about. Stay tuned. We know that uh, now the White House has taken a look at it. Apparently, Nancy Pelosi got a look at it yesterday. She said, I'm okay with it. A lot of people are calling for him to veto it, uh, but you have uh, Senator Richard Shelby, the Republican from Alabama. He said, when asked, will the president approve of this, he said, we think so and we hope so. But the president did say yesterday, I'm never going to sign a bill that forces the mass release of violent criminals. And if you look at the stats, ICE figures 66% of the immigrants that were detained last year in 2018 were previously convicted of crimes. And in 2016, that number was 86%. Yeah, it's real. And they're, gonna, they're already building the wall from 2017. They start this week, and then they'll, they'll be able to continue building it now there's enough money there. Meanwhile, seven minutes after the top of the hour, one of the many controversies coming your way, and it's easy to have gotten buried in getting caught up in what's happening in Virginia with all three of these uh, high-ranking officials. But uh, it's hard also to take your eye off this congresswoman, Elon Omar. She's out of Minnesota, and she has uh, made a few comments where clearly she seems to be uh, have a problem with our pro-Israeli position uh, in America. And how do I do? Why do I think that? Because I read her tweets. Yeah, because she had to apologize for this. Uh, it was a tweet in response to journalist Green, uh, Glenn Greenwald's tweet. Uh, Republican leader Kevin McCarthy threatened punishment for her and uh, Rashida Tlaib over their criticism of Israel. It's stunning how much time U.S. political leaders spend defending a foreign nation, even if it means attacking free speech rights of Americans. And then she tweeted. It's all about the Benjamins, baby. Uh, she has since walked that back and apologized to a point. Here's well, the president and what he said about her yesterday. He, he said, I think she should be ashamed of herself. I think it was a terrible statement, and I don't think her apology was adequate. A lot of Democrats came out against her, condemning her. Nancy Pelosi condemned her, and that's when she decided to, to release her statement. Right, and she said that AIPAC is paying off, essentially, lawmakers to have this pro-Israeli stance. Ben right. Shapiro took umbrage with this. How do you not have a censorship of uh, a, a resolution of censure? against Ilhan Omar for all of this. And the reason is because the Democratic Party deep down actually agrees with Ilhan Omar. The Democratic Party, unfortunately, has become a party that is replete with anti-Semitism and certainly with anti-Israel activity. I was there in 2012 when the idea of Jerusalem as Israel's capital was booed at their convention. The willingness to consort with open Jew hating in the Democratic Party is pretty obvious at this point. OK, so uh, Nancy Pelosi and uh, top Democratic leaders did say, look, you've got to ap uh, apologize. But they did not. As the New York Post in their op-ed page this morning says, the failure to discipline Omar stands in contrast to House Republicans who stripped Representative Steve King of his committee assignments for lamenting the fact that the white supremacy is deemed an offensive term. Mm. So they're Double saying standard. what there's that's exactly what they're talking about. Yeah. So, and by the way, to Nancy Pelosi's credit, she condemned the remarks and demanded the apology. And that got her attention. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see where that goes. At least at least. I just don't know why she'd still leave there on the Foreign Relations Committee. When it's, if she's that upset with her stance on Israel, why would you have her in such an important committee that has everything to do with our policy on Israel in the House? Great question.
And that's what a lot of people are scratching their heads about today. All right. We're also asking, is Jillian here? Oh, there she surprise. is. Surprise. She has some headlines for us. <laughs> that's right. Good morning. Let's get you caught up on what's happening in Virginia. And today, one of the women accusing Virginia's lieutenant governor of sexual assault will speak out publicly. Dr. Vanessa Tyson will be part of a panel titled Betrayal and Courage in the Age of Me Too at Stanford University tonight. This happening as several members of Justin Fairfax's staff resign over the allegations against him. Fairfax has denied the allegations and called for an FBI investigation into them. The former Chicago police officer who shot and killed Laquan McDonald could get a new sentence. Prosecutors believe the nearly seven-year sentence given to Jason Van Dyke last month is not enough. They're asking the Illinois Supreme Court to review the case. Van Dyke was found guilty of second-degree murder and aggravated battery for shooting the 17-year-old in 2014. People in Iowa could soon support their favorite candidates without leaving their homes. State Democrats proposing virtual caucuses in the 2020 election. It's the biggest proposed change to the system in nearly 50 years. They say the use of smart devices will make the process more accessible and transparent. Currently, people have to physically show up and stand in groups to support presidential candidates. Country music legend Garth Brooks is trading in his cowboy hat for a baseball cap. Brooks is joining the Pittsburgh Pirates for a week of spring training this year. It's the fourth time he's joined a major league team. This year, he's returning to the field for the 20th anniversary of the Garth Brooks Teammates for Kids Foundation. It pairs children with professional athletes and has raised more than $100 million. Even though he did not grow up in Pittsburgh, he grew up a Pirates fan. Right, so, right. cool to do that. It's just shocking. $100 million yep. that has raised. Mm -hmm. Good for him. All right. All right. Thank Thanks, you, Jillian. All right, uh, straight ahead, California Senator Kamala Harris prosecuted pot as California's attorney general. But now that she's running for president, she's saying this. I think that it gives a lot of people joy and we need more <laughs> joy. <laughs> she's talking about pot giving people a lot of joy. Is that the biggest political flip-flop ever? We're going to talk about it. Plus, you know him and love him as Lieutenant Dan and Forrest Gump, also CSI. But do you know the one word that inspired Gary Sinise to help our heroes like nobody else maybe in this country? We'll share that story in his new book in just a moment. I believe we need to legalize marijuana. And we need to research, which is one of the reasons we need to legalize it. We need to move it on the schedule so that we can um, research. Have you ever smoked? I have. Okay. And I think that it gives a lot of people joy, and we need more <laughs> joy. joy <laughs> Uh, and the crowd roared. Uh, presidential candidate Kamala Harris pushing for marijuana legalization at the federal level, in part because, quote, it brings joy. But the California senator didn't back legalization for recreational use until last year. Is this a flip-flop because she's now running for president? Uh, here to react, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, Dr. David Murray, formerly worked in the Office of the National Drug Control Policy. Uh, Dr. Murray, you're concerned about the tone especially. Why? Oh, good morning, Brian. Because my impression is this is no longer a time in this country where we want to make jokes about addiction. And this was a very jocular tone. And moreover, I don't think anyone who wants to be a presidential leader can ignore and be blissfully kind of unaware of uh, the medical and scientific literature on just how dangerous and serious legalized commercial high-potency marijuana is. I, I also sensed a little bit of an insensitivity here since I'm very familiar with the thousands of parents all across the country who are struggling to recover their own children from marijuana addiction and where that leads. It's doing great damage in adolescent lives. And, and any senator, any uh, wish, uh, presidential aspirant really needs to be more aware of what the research shows and I think needs to move beyond the Cheech and Chong world of laughing about Jamaica and California. It didn't help Jamaica. It's not going to help California. Legalization is a much more serious threat. So, uh, Dr. Murray, a couple of things. Number one, people say, put pot here and yeah. put uh, uh, fentanyl and heroin here. Don't mix the two. What do you say? Uh, the, well, the one doesn't lead to the other. But Brian, I think the research is actually disrupting that simplified notion that there's a soft drug over here called marijuana, and it can be separated from the 
overdose crisis that the country is going through, the unprecedented. More than 70,000 Americans lost their lives in the most recent year, 2017. That's an astonishing link, however, is that early adolescent marijuana exposure is actually tied to the opioid epidemic and the overdose uh, disaster that we've that we've kind of inculcated here. It primes the brain, particularly for young adolescents who are exposed to the high potency industrial commercial marijuana that is available now. They're smoking right. shatter and they're smoking concentrates. They're vaporizing them that are 70 and 90 percent concentrates of THC. The neurotoxicity here is extraordinary. They are right. linked epidemics. Dr. Moore, we, we only have 20 seconds left, but I want to get this. I'm Great. She's just going with the trend. Uh, first is medicinal, then there's recreational. More and more states are legalizing it. So yeah. she wants to stay, get the young vote by staying with the trend. What do you say to her? My impression is you don't get the young vote by putting them in great jeopardy. And the damage that we're going to do to this generation in this experiment is very great. My impression is she's made a mistake. She called for more research. But unfortunately, she said, let's legalize first and then do research on what we've done to ourselves. That's not the way to work. She right. needs to be more familiar with the research that's already been done. Gotcha. That is issuing a strong warning to us. Don't go there. And Dr. Marsha, in the pre-interview, a lot of these polls are soft, uh, much softer than we were led to believe about approval and the way Americans think of it. Dr. David Murray, Indeed. important conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. Straight ahead. Uh, what's at the top of Amy Klobuchar's agenda if she becomes president? Rejoining the Paris climate change, of course. Does she know why we left to begin with? Our next guest has the science. The people are on our side when it comes to climate change. Why? Because like you and I, they believe. News by the numbers. First, 43 percent. That's New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's favorability rating, his lowest since taking office. According to a Siena College survey, the Democrat dropped eight percentage points in just one month. Next, 1.17 million. That is how much a man disguised in a scream mask just won in the lottery. The Jamaican man wore the mask from the horror movie to keep his identity a secret. He claims the winning numbers came to him in a dream. And we all said we need to have that dream. And finally, number one, J.J. Watt will become the first NFL star to be the Grand Marshal of the Daytona 500. He will be the one to tell the drivers to start their engines before Sunday's race on Fox. Steve and Brian, over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Ainsley. Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar, as you can see, just announced her candidacy for presidency <laughs> and wasted no time promising to fight climate change and rejoin the Paris Climate Accord that the Trump administration unjoined. The people are on our side when it comes to climate change. Why? Because like you and I, they believe in science. And on day one, we will rejoin the International Climate Agreement. Well, there's a reason why President Trump pulled out, uh, pulled the U.S. out of the deal. And our next guest says it would stay. Uh, it should stay that way. Joining us right now to discuss this, Executive Director for ClimateDepot.com and author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change, Mark Morano. The world booed when we got out, Mark. Why, should, why, uh, why, why shouldn't we go back in? Well, amazingly, the one thing that the, the key thing that Donald Trump has been consistent on since the 1980s has been deals that are good for America. You can go back to his right. Oprah Winfrey interview. So the U.N. Paris Agreement was a was literally one of the simplest decisions that President Trump could possibly make. And he made a brilliant decision. The U.N. Paris Agreement would do nothing for the climate. And using the U.N.'s own estimate, even if you believe Al Gore and the U.N. scientific claims, it would delay a temperature by eight months if Obama's President Obama's uh, climate commitments came into full fruition by 100 years. In other words, it does nothing for the climate, virtually does nothing for emissions and imposing it on the United States. And beyond that, she says she believes in science. The head of the U.N. climate panel has actually said he, quote, global warming is my religion. So here you have a, a U.N. group that wants to redistribute wealth, centrally transform uh, our economy, and they want the United States in because they want to get our money and they want wealth transfers and they openly talk about global governance. So it was the greatest decision Donald Trump made, and it, had no, and it has no impact on the climate one way or the other. Okay, so um, regarding the Paris Climate Accord, these are some of the points. It would limit the amount of greenhouse gases. It would yeah. keep global temps well below uh, two Good degrees one. Celsius. Uh, review each country's contribution every five years. Rich countries to help poor by providing climate finance. 
ultimately, though, Mark, how much would it have cost the United States and how many degrees would it have changed the temperature? Well, that's the thing. Now, it's been called the most expensive treaty in world history with a price tag of up to $100 trillion, oh. a global cost of one to two trillion dollars annually. And again, not that you mentioned this two degree thing. And I actually point out this was the, the authors of this two degrees target actually admit it was, quote, pulled from thin air. Or the scientists in the United Nations admit us. So and then the, even the Washington Post has acknowledged that even if you're afraid of global warming, the U.N. Mm -hmm. Paris Agreement would basically do nothing, has no impact on the climate. This is medieval witchcraft to think that we can all come together with some right. treaty, make a bunch of pledges and have a temperature 100 years that's different. But again, using the UN's own numbers, mm -hmm. eight months the temperature uh, rise would be delayed if you believe the UN right. scientific claims. Right. Not even a year if the U.S. does its full commitments under President Obama. Mark, no mechanism for enforcement, and we have to take the word that gradually China would go live up yes. to the standards that we are. Gradually, as well as Russia. Yes. And that's absurd. I mean, China, India are building coal plants uh, on a skyrocketing uh, scale right now. Right. China's emissions are going to continue for the next more than a decade until they peak. But the United States is expected to come in. And as President Trump has rightly pointed out, this is a bad deal for America. It's punishing Americans okay. while giving everyone else off the hook. And again, gotcha. this isn't the Middle Ages. We don't pass laws to control hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, and control temperature. But well, Camilla Harris, I mean, uh, Amy Klobuchar knows one thing. Thing. This is what the Democratic base right. has to has to hear. And, and, they, they go back. and that's why they all signed on to the Green New Deal. That's that right. topic another day. All right. Yes. Thank you very much, Mark. All right. Thank uh, you. Coming up straight ahead. What are voters in El Paso saying about President Trump and Beto O'Rourke's dueling rallies? Todd Pyro there having breakfast with friends. We'll check in with him shortly. That's right. And you love him as Lieutenant Dan and Forrest Gump. Do not salute me. There's goddamn snipers all around this area who love to grease an office. I'm Lieutenant Dan Taylor. Welcome to Fort Platoon. Yep, welcome. But did you know Gary Sinise actually grew up in a military family with service stretching all the way to World War I? He's here live with a brand new book. She's holding it. He's next on Facebook is going viral this morning. That's so sweet. A fire chaplain in North Carolina says the kids put their hands over their hearts and said the Pledge of Allegiance when they saw the fire department raising the flag. It's been shared on Facebook more than 4,000 times. Very, very nice. Glad they did that so we could salute them on this Tuesday morning. That's right. All right, Brian? All right, uh, okay, let's get started. A firefighter shortage is happening in Pennsylvania big time, forcing the state into a public safety crisis. Since the 1970s, the number of, numbers of volunteer firefighters in the state has declined by 88%. And a new report warns that other areas could face a similar problem. This comes as the Border Patrol struggles to recruit and now keep agents. So how can we get the Americans, uh, get Americans to serve their communities? Our panel here to discuss it. Uh, former Westchester County Police Sergeant uh, Steve Cardian is here. Steve, welcome back. Spokesperson of the Fire, uh, Firemen Association of the State of New York, Robert Leonard, is here. And uh, former ICE Supervisor Jason Piccolo. All right, uh, Jason, first off, I know you're more uh, Border Patrol, but when, in terms of fire department, what's going on? It's tough to get people to come out here and serve right now, especially you have these abolish ICE movements, you have abolish police movements. It's just a tough situation to get people to volunteer. What's changed? Changes have been in economics and socioeconomic factors. There are two income families, husband and wife both work, the guy works two jobs, the wife works two jobs. You work further from home, you commute 30, 40 miles to work when you used to be, you lived in town, you drove the ice truck, you parked it, went to the fire call and came back. So things have changed a lot. Steve, I think also a lot of it has to do with advertising. I think the first time I saw volunteers wanted was uh, about two months ago. I saw it on an electronic school, but you know, we need people. I just thought you guys were fully, they were fully staffed. Now, volunteering is one of the best things you could do to give back to your community. And what we see is that now, this has changed. They're doing it for self-need. They're doing, uh, they're not doing it for self-need. They're doing it because they have hefty uh, college loans. They've got two income families and they have other interests. They're interested in sports. We don't have the time to do this anymore. The internet has become a big tool that has diminished volunteerism. I mean, does it, you need a campaign almost like the army does, where they give you the image award, you know, the image idea of what it means, so, Jason? Well, you know, what happens is a lot of times people go to the border and they get border burnout after three to five years. How are you going to sell that to someone? These are remote areas. You're not going to be getting, um, I was lucky enough to go to San Diego 
But what happens if you go to one of these small areas like Ajo, Arizona? Well, McCallum. Yeah, McCallum. And, and nothing wrong with small towns, but there's not a lot going on. Robert, the other thing is, too, they're being run down politically, correct? Well, the volunteer fire service is kind of unique. We serve everybody. Right. Um, we don't have some of the challenges law enforcement has, but our challenge is education. You referred to it before, that digital sign you saw, being on Facebook and Internet. It's educating people. You can volunteer and serve your community, and despite political factors, volunteers aren't paid. Our budgets aren't as controlled as, say, the paid right. staff at, at police departments. Right, and uh, see the other thing. So we know about uh, the academies with cops. We know now about volunteer firefighters. We know Border Patrol. You know what I fear is next ICE? Because we're so polarized, ICE, you're putting your life on the line on a regular basis. Nine out of every ten pickups are criminals. So you're putting, and then you're hearing derision, people protesting outside your office? Well, Brian, I've said for 100 years, if you tie law enforcement's hands, if you don't give them the public and the administrative support that they need, they're going to shut down. You're not going to get the people that you, that you really want to attract. You're going to lose 10 percent of the, the cops do 90 percent of the work. They're going to shut down. They're going to do less work because they don't want to get jammed up and lose their, their, their salary to protect their family. And Jason, too, when it comes to the families here, oh, you're, you're, you're a dad, you're a husband, oh, he's in ICE, he's one of those people anti-immigrant because they've been labeled like that by the Democratic Party in many cases. Hey, you're finding divisions within families now. You might have someone that leans a little bit to the left who has a brother that's an ICE agent who's, hey, you know what, how can you possibly go out there and arrest these innocents? Right, Robert, lastly, just give a pitch sure. to volunteer firefighters. Volunteer firefighters, there are about 800,000 in the country right now. There were about 900,000 30 years ago. We've lost over 10% of our population. The call volume's gone up three times. We oh. need more people to come help. What's we, great about it? What's great about it? You serve your community. You are out there in the community with your neighbors. I go to my own neighbor's homes and they have a problem and I help solve the problem. So it's a really good feeling. You're also re reviving people. You're Absolutely. Just we do fire. emergency medical services. We do firefighting. We do uh, rescue. We right. are a training ground for future careers in firefighting and EMS that can lead to law enforcement careers and federal careers. So we think it's an important thing to do to volunteer. It was important you guys came out. Thanks so much for your message. Thank you, Brian. All right, let's go upstairs where we've sequestered Jillian to tell us what's going on in the news. Good stuff. Thank you, Brian. Let's start with this. President Trump says Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, quote, should be ashamed of herself. He's slamming the Minnesota Democrat for accusing a lobbying group of paying members of Congress to support Israel. Omar has apologized, saying, quote, my intention is never to offend my constituents or Jewish Americans as a whole. But in that same statement, she says, quote, I reaffirm the problematic role of lobbyists in our politics, whether it be APAC, the NRA or the fossil fuel industry. A semi-truck slams into a police cruiser. Look at that after speeding through a red light. The terrifying moments caught on camera in Wisconsin. The officer was initially trapped inside his vehicle, but somehow managed to escape uninjured, thankfully. The speeding driver was cited for driving too fast for the wintry weather conditions. Officers sharing these photos urging drivers to slow down. Katy Perry brand shoes are being pulled off the shelves after critics pointed out the resemblance to blackface. The slip-on loafers and block heel sandals featured two eyes, a nose, and red lips on a black shoe. Beige and gold versions were also available as part of a collection reportedly meant as a nod to modern art. Perry tells The Hollywood Reporter, quote, our intention was never to inflict any pain. Chris Pratt responding to actress Ellen Page after she called him out for attending a church she claims is anti-LGBTQ. Pratt posting on Instagram, quote, nothing could be further from the truth. I go to a church that opens their doors to absolutely everyone. The Guardians of the Galaxy star attends Zoe Church. He says that community helped him get through his divorce from Anna Faris. So look at your headlines. I'll send it down to you guys. All right. Thank you very much, Jillian. Arnold's got his back anyway. <sighs> Good to know. Daughter, daughter. All right, the winter storm wreaking havoc across the Midwest, closing in on the Northeast. That's right. The snowy and icy mess causing massive pileups across much of uh, the Great Lakes and Wisconsin. We asked Janice Dean to track this system, and she has with her system. Oh, yes, it is happening. Uh, really from the northwest across the upper Midwest in towards the northeast, they already are canceling schools across Long Island and parts of uh, upstate New York. Let's take a look at the maps real quick, and I will show you the track of the storm. Even though 
it's not going to perhaps produce a lot of snow along the coast, it is going to give the threat for ice. And that's why they're getting ahead of it and they are canceling schools in and around the northeast. Uh, where we see that pink on the map, we have a freezing rain and ice storm warning for parts of Chicago into towards Toledo. Wouldn't be surprised to see ice storm advisories up towards uh, maybe New York City in towards Long Island and Connecticut over the next couple of hours. Because even though this is not going to be a blockbuster winter storm producing a lot of snow, the ice is what is going to be very concerning that could triple or rather cripple travel. And that's the concern. So there are your snowfall forecasts. I don't really want you to really pay close attention to them because it's the icing, the icing that will make the headlines. And then across the northwest, another storm system moving in there, bringing more mountain snow and coastal rain. So busy day across the country. We'll keep you posted here in the northeast. I expect some snow probably within the next hour around Fox Square. Back inside. I think that's probably right. And Janice, I'm looking at uh, one of the local uh, websites in there. It looks like hundreds of schools. Yes, absolutely. The already canceled. They want to get ahead of that ice. Yep. But if you're a kid, study at home. Do you have your books with you? Why bother? It's snow day. Oh. All right. Uh, thanks, J.D. Meanwhile, what are voters in El Paso, Texas, saying about President Trump and Beto so O'Rourke's dueling rallies what? last night? Todd Pyro, as you can see right there, is at a diner in El Paso. We're going to check in with him coming up next. Plus, uh, the liberal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals delivering a win for President Trump on the wall. How significant is the ruling? We woke the judge up, and he's going to walk here as I put it on camera. There you go. The notoriously liberal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals out west actually has sided with the Trump administration, what? pinch me, in a case challenging its, judge, I was just kidding, in challenging its use of waivers to bypass environmental regulations in constructing a border wall. Well, here to break it all down, what this exactly means for the Trump administration and moving forward is Fox News senior judicial analyst and host of Liberty File on Fox Nation, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Good Judge morning. So, shockingly, this is not a part of the border wall to be built under the Trump administration. This was authorized under the Obama administration. Right. And the statute that authorizes it said if environmental regulations would impede or prevent the construction of the wall, it's a relatively small piece, it's not what President Trump wants to build, that the Secretary of Homeland Security, currently a Trump appointee, Secretary Nielsen, can waive the environmental uh, regulations. She waived them, the environmentalists went to court, a federal judge enjoined her. Yesterday, the Ninth Circuit lifted the injunction and said, we, we don't have anything to do with whether or not the wall should be built. The Congress authorized it three years ago. Does she have the authority to waive the regulations? Answer, yes. So it is surprising, not that this is the outcome, because the law is pretty standard. It's surprising that this is the outcome in the Ninth Circuit, sure. where it does appear as though judges appointed by uh, presidents other than Donald Trump have done everything that they can to stymie him. And I know there's some positions open, and President Trump is looking to put those judges into the Ninth District. Do you know where that's at? Yes, I do know where it's at, and I'm not exactly crazy about it, because he, uh, the White House has decided to cooperate with the two senators from California which means you're not going to get people that are exactly Trumpians uh, on the court. All right. Listen, they don't have the authority to stop it, but they have the authority to delay and frustrate it. Uh, speaking of delay, it sounds like Michael Cohen, who used to be the president's uh, attorney, oh, fixer boy. guy, he has agreed, yep, I'm going to come down, I'm going to talk to Congress, I'm going to testify away. He has now canceled for a third time. This, he must be getting cold feet. I mean, I can't, I can't. Well, he's had surgery. He's had shoulder surgery. We didn't know about the surgery. He had the surgery, and the doctors have said, you know, he's got to rest. He is going away on March 6th. I bet your bottom dollar that is not going to be delayed.